Bibles and turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. I will warn you, this sermon is lengthy. Uh, I will try to skip a little here and there as I can. But if I get through it, I get through it. But if I don't, I don't. You know, I was thinking about what, what mentioned to Eunice when she mentioned uh, with the people in her family that had that COVID. I probably know or know of at least 20 people that have had this stupid virus that's gone around. But four or one family, three or one other family. So it's amazing that just how far spread it is. And uh, but I'm thankful that we're getting a handle on it. And uh, the death counts are way down. So I just like I think people don't really need to. I'm not saying don't don't pretend it's not out there. But I don't think you need to fear fear it like when it first started. I certainly don't think that. So let's stand together and let me read from verse 17 down to verse 24 from Ephesians 4. We break these chapters up sometimes for all the wherefores and the therefores are, and so where I left off last week because verse 17 has a therefore and it just makes a natural breaking point. He said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye have forth walked not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. I got out of line that phrase, vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Father, we ask your blessing on the teaching of this text. And as I try to make the sense of it, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, challenge our lives. And uh, Lord, I pray that you help the young people to realize the philosophy of the world and the philosophy of the Bible. And the, your philosophy really are just night and day. And so may you bless the teaching of your word to the hearts of your people in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, baby. Seated. We read up a little bit here, and it's one of the, the fundamental truths of the Bible where it says this. You, it teaches this. You put off the old man, and you put on the new man. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, a transformation takes place in our basic nature. The New Testament speaks of believers, listen to all of these things, I'm going to listen off real quick. Having a new mind, we have a new will, because when we got saved, we gave up our will to the Lord. We have a new heart, we have a new inheritance, we have a new relationship, we have new power, we have new knowledge, we have new wisdom, we have new perception, we have new understanding, we have new righteousness, we have new love, we have new desires, God changes our want to, we are, have a new citizenship, and all of which are all summed up in the Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 where it says this, and you might want to turn to Romans 6, but I'll be turning to chapter 1 and chapter 7 there later on. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, and here's how he said it, in newness of life. We are to walk, beloved, in newness of life. At the new birth. That is, when a person realized they were a sinner. They understood that they deserved to go to hell. God illuminated their mind and it was like, wow. I have sinned against a holy God and I deserve to spend eternity in hell. But then he also understands the love of God, where God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and to shed his blood and to rise again from the dead. And so he realizes that Jesus paid my sin debt. Amen. You can't pay your sin debt. Only Jesus can pay your sin debt. Right. So at the new birth experience, a person has realized all of that. And so he cries out to God from his heart and he accepts Jesus as the Savior. And he is born again by the Spirit of God. And until that experience happens in your life, you are not a born again child of God. God just works in a marvelous way. So he's a born again, and you could either say after, I prefer to say at the time of the new birth, he becomes a new creature in Christ. 
instantaneously. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm a new creature. And then he said, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's a new man. She's a new woman. That child is a new child. That transformed person is completely new. In contrast to the former love of evil, the new self, the deepest, truest part of the Christian, loves the Word of God. There is just, they just love the Word of God. Amen. If you're here this morning and are listening and you don't love the Word of God, I would say you're probably not a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. They have a love for the Word of God. They desire to fulfill its righteous demand. They hate sin. All believers hate sin. They long for deliverance from the redeemed man. And by the way, beloved, one day we will be delivered from this old flesh. Why then? Look at Romans chapter 7. If you would. Why then is it we continue to sin after we're believers? Well, Paul mentioned quite a bit about that in this chapter. I'll just read a couple of verses now. Paul said in verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do, do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, he said, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So Paul understood, he, he had a longing to do, in fact, if you read this entire chapter, you'll see where he says it. He had a longing to do right, he had a longing to be righteous and godly and holy, but there was still that sin deal, the old flesh. Sin is still present. And sin keeps us from living perfectly in line with what our new nature already is. But one day, that's all going to change. Because one day, we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. One day, we will possess the fullness of a divine nature without the corruption of our old, unredeemed flesh. And that is a promise to every single believer. And isn't it going to be a wonderful thing to be delivered from the very presence of sin? And the sinful flesh will be gone. Now, I was going to say, can you imagine living without your sinful flesh? But you can't. You can't. You know why? You've never done that. You've never lived without your sinful flesh. You have no, we have no idea how amazing that's going to be. Go back to chapter 6 in the book of Romans. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, let me say something. The believer has residing sin, but he doesn't have reigning sin. Sin can't reign over him, but it's still, that flesh is there. He's a new man. He's created in righteousness and holiness, awaiting for full salvation from the very presence of sin. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul makes two appeals based on the fact that believers are new creatures. The first one is in verse 1 that we covered a couple of weeks ago. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So his first appeal there was that you walk a worthy walk. That you walk what you say you are in name. And then he makes the second one down here in verse 17. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the, and notice this phrase, in the vanity of their mind. Now there is a contrast with the walk of the world and the wicked unbelievers than the walk of a spiritual Christian. They are different. Christians ought to be different than everybody else in the world. Now, he follows that contrast with four more of these wherefores or therefores. Let me just show them to you or point them out to you. The first one you'll see next to be in verse 25. That's why I stopped reading in verse 24. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor. And then there's another one there in chapter 5 and verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God. There's another one in verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers. And then there's one more in verse 15. 
See then that ye walk circumspectly. That's the wrong verse. Uh, verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding. So he's got these wherefores and therefores. And by the way, as we go through the book of Ephesians, that's all the breakout places that I've chosen to break out the chapter. Now they show the Christian proper response to being a new creature in Christ. Now get this. When you trusted Jesus, God expects something out of you. When I trusted Jesus, God expected something out of me. I didn't have any clue about that when I trusted the Lord. But I learned quickly thereafter that God expects something out of me. I was witnessing to a man when I was still working at the mill, and I witnessed to him countless times. We worked together, we saw each other four or five days a week, sometimes six days a week. And uh, we got to become, we had good, we developed a friendship. And we, we hunted, he hunted, I hunted, he fished, I fished. So we had this bond. And uh, then one day he says to me, so if I get saved, God's going to expect something out of me, isn't he? I said, that's exactly right. God's going to expect something out of you. He got it. He understood that. It seems like there's some professing Christian, Christians anyway that don't get that. Now listen. A change of nature demands a change of behavior. We're new creatures in Christ. So the book seems to flow. I have a common flow to it. Since God has saved you and has created this new person in you, uh, this is how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to put off the old man and put on the new man. That ought to be just the natural way it happens. The kids sing a church, a song in uh, junior church quite often. The things I used to do, I don't do anymore. The things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. Then they had 4,000 verses to that song. Uh, you know, it's like the things I used to watch on TV, I don't watch that anymore. And, uh, and, 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 and it goes with stuff like the way I used to talk, I don't talk that way anymore. Now I want you to notice the contrast here. Verses 17 through 19 talk about the walk of the old self. The law said. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. He says, Don't live like the world. Don't live like the old self. It is a call to purity and holiness of heart and life. Now listen, we cannot accomplish the glorious work of Christ of continuing if we continue to live in the way of the world. We can't, we can't do what God wants us to do if we're worldly. The word Gentiles I mentioned there, Paul actually mentioned it, uh, represents all the ungodly, unregenerate pagans. Now the church in Ephesus, that's who this was written to originally, and in our day as well, was surrounded by terrible rank paganism. And it was full of immorality. Just like you used to say America, but just like the world is full of immorality today. But America's no better. Now, we were and they were like a group of people on an island of wickedness. They were despised people like we are. By the way, there was an article two or three days ago I read it said churches are probably the worst place during a COVID pandemic that there is. I thought to myself, that's the most ridiculous thing I have ever read. Some of you may have read the same article. By the way, John MacArthur was on Fox News the other night. Man, I tell you what, I don't know what you think of him, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for that man. And the, the interview where she finally cut him off. But, uh, he pastors a church of about 7,000 people in California. Grace Community Church, I think is the name of it. And uh, somebody said to, said to him, to him, he goes, well, he goes, I know we've had 9,000 people that in California. He says, but there's 42 million people here. So 9,000 out of 42 million, and we're not making light of 9,000, but that's not a very high percentage. It's like less, way less than 1%, way less than 1%. So then he said this. He said, Governor Newsom is not the head of the church. We respect Governor Newsom, but he's not the head of the church. Amen. He said, the mayor, you can give the mayor's name, there, he's not the head of the church. And then he said this right on national television, then they stopped him. 
He said, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And he purchased the church with his own blood. And then the interviewer probably had was enough of that. <laughs> anyway, they had four other questions for him, but they never did give him a chance to answer those questions. Listen, when we got saved, God expects us to change. But the world, and you heard me preach on this while ago, that the world hates the church. Because we aren't supposed to be like them. We, we really don't have a whole lot in common. So here we are. Go back, to, go, to, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're a small group of people in this island of wickedness. A cesspool, really. But notice what he said here. I love these verses. He said in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then this next phrase, and such were some of you. But, watch what he says, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And aren't you glad you are? Amen. Now here's a problem with second generation Christians oftentimes, not all the time, but sometimes. They don't realize the cesspool of sin that God has graciously saved them from. And Paul encouraged them, don't walk that way anymore. Peter did the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 4. So, on the basis of who we are in Christ, new creatures, and of all that God now proposes uh, for us as his redeemed and beloved children, we are to be absolutely distinct from the rest of the world because we are citizens of another country. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, but love the Father, it's not in him. We, we are to not be in love with this world. Now let me just say this. The world's standards are wrong. The world's motives are wrong. The world's aims are wrong. The ways of the world, they're wrong also. They're deceitful, corrupt, and destructive. They're all sinful. Oh, this is God's standard. And then he lists four specific characteristics that I'm going to mention here in a moment of the ungodly pagan lifestyle that we as believers are to forsake. And I want you to look at verse 17, the end of the verse, back in Ephesians 4. He said this. In the vanity of their mind. Now let me put that into my language. First of all, they have a warped mind. Yeah. People of the world have a warped mind. They have worldly philosophy. All right, you young people. Who said this? This is worldly philosophy. Let's see if any of you remember it. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Anybody know where that came from? Go ahead, Lily. Elsa and let it go. Elsa and what? Let it go. It's all. So that what movie is that thing? Frozen. Thank you, Frozen. How many of you kids have ever watched Frozen? Look at that. Now listen. That is just another one in a whole list of ungodly philosophy that Disney movies put out. They've been putting them out for years. They're probably not going to stop putting them. They started out real good, by the way. But now they're not so much. But let me read it again. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. You're never free when you don't have rules. All rules have boundaries around them. That is an ungodly philosophy of the world that is promoted by movies. That's one of the ways they promote them. The basic issue of lifestyle centers in your mind. Look at verse 18. Because he's talked about in the vanity of the mind. He says having the understanding uh, darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. <clears throat> their understanding is darkened. 
He mentions learning and taught in verses 20 and 21. He mentions the mind and truth in verses 23 and 24. Believers and non-believers think differently. That's why in the politics we say these guys are wrong and these guys are right. But they just, we think differently. We act differently. They can't think right. They can't think straight. Especially on moral issues. There is a secular worldview and there is a Christian worldview. The secular worldview will say something like, it's okay to get drunk. What's the big deal with that? It's okay to go to the casino and gamble just because it preys on the poor and takes a those, you know, that. What's, the, that. what's the big deal? But there's also a Christian worldview, and they are really, really different. Christian worldview says we're pro-life. We're anti I, I gotta tell you a story on that too. And then they say, no, 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 we're pro-choice. In other words, we believe in abortions. But Christians don't believe in abortion. But the world does. Then uh, we say, we believe in a traditional marriage where a man and a woman get married and have babies. They say, no, 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 no. We believe in same-sex marriage. We say transgenderism is okay. By the way, the pedophiles are pushing for their rights now. You knew when they passed same-sex marriage it opened Pandora's box. You knew that it's going to do that. But we say, no, we don't think like that. Uh, as believers, we say, let's give. The worldly philosophy is, no, let's take. The world says, we're just going to live together as a guy and a girl and enjoy all the bliss of marriage like we're married. And then if it doesn't work out so well, we won't have to go through the hassle of the divorce and all that stuff. But we don't believe that. We believe you stay pure till marriage. But the world is the opposite of that. When we say we think differently, I mean on moral issues, we really think differently. Because man's sinfulness, it flows out of his reprobate mind. The transformation begins in the mind. Salvation begins in the mind. This truth is revealed to you by God. The first step in repentance is a change of mind about yourself, your spiritual, spiritual condition, and about God. And Paul says, the lost mind is vain. It's darkened, it's ignorant, it's blinded, verses 18 and 19. It's blinded to spiritual truth. Do you ever witness to somebody or try to talk to somebody about the Lord and it's like you might as well go beat your head on the wall because they just don't get it? Well, you're right. They just don't get it. They don't have any spiritual light there. They just don't. The unregenerate plans and resolve, resolves things on his own thinking. By the way, let me get here before I forget. Go to Romans chapter 12. Some of you can probably assume we will turn here in a moment. Verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here is how you transform your mind. Right here. The Word of God. You get into the Word of God, and you bathe yourself, and you fill yourself with the Word of God, and God changes the way you think to where you say, I used to think well, this was okay, but I realized from the Word of God that I was wrong, and the Word of God is right. I'll go back a few other pages to Romans chapter 1. I mean, you ought to just read this whole chapter from verse 18 to the end of it, but let me just read a couple of verses, verse uh, 21 and 22. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Paul said almost the same thing in Ephesians. And their foolish heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Fools. The way they think is warped thinking and it's foolishness. It's just, they're just foolish. Someone said they have stinking thinking. They have a warped mind. And they are blinded to spiritual truth. They just don't get it. Then if you go back to Ephesians 4, for, but keep the marker there in Romans 1. I think I'm going to come back to that. Let me read verse 18 again of, of chapter 4. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through, and he said, the ignorance that is in them. They are ignorant of God's truth. They are spiritually uninformed. 
They, 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 that's a huge problem in our world today. People are spiritually and biblically uninformed. The word ignorant just means you don't know. It's not like not, no one say anything bad. They just, they just don't know. They are spiritually uninformed. And like it was in Ephesus, just like it is in America, people are spiritually uninformed. They pride in science, just like they did in Ephesus. They pride in technology. They pride in literature and things like that. But here's the point. Ignorance and sinfulness, they go together. They go together. They are, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, ever learning, but what? Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They just don't get it. They never get it. Fallen mankind has a built-in inability to know and comprehend, comprehend the things of God. That's why God illuminates our mind, and then he brings us to the point of a decision where we either choose for or choose against Christ. Romans 1, verse 21, I read it, it says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They are spiritually in darkness. Remember what Paul said earlier in this book in Ephesians 2, verse 1? They are dead in trespasses and sins. Satan is also at work. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Um, John chapter 12, I believe. Look, if somebody told me last week that they couldn't keep up because I was bouncing around too many verses. Well, I don't even have my sticky things on my finger today, all right, so that helps. John 12, verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understood with their heart and be converted and that I should heal them. People just are blinded to spiritual truth. That is why the Spirit of God has to reveal truth to us. So they have warped thinking. They are ignorant of God's truth. And that's why lost people, uh, by the way, that's why you should not make lost people your closest friends. Amen. And it is also why you should never get your advice from lost people either. Amen. They are ignorant to spiritual truth. Thirdly, they are spiritually and morally blinded or callous. They reject all moral and spiritual truth. That's a huge way why Christianity is different than the world. Sins that were once hidden or excused back in our day, they are they're indulged in openly and blatantly and even publicly today. And I said this already, but I might as well say it again. And they're promoted by the television industry and the Hollywood industry. Abortion, euthanizing people, homosexuality, transgenderism, pedophilia. I suppose some of you watch the news. Have you been following this Epstein stuff? That is just sickening. And I mean sickening. I'd like to see a whole bunch of these people, including one of our former presidents, end up in prison. Amen. It's just awful. Just, it's just, just, it's just, it's just terrible. They have uh, warped. I mean, you know, I believe in the total depravity of mankind, but it is amazing to me how wicked and evil people can actually be. It kind of blows you away. There are a lot of big name people. Go back there. I got to go back there. I don't I didn't put a room in the ribbon there, but Romans chapter one again. The last verse, verse thirty-two. Who, knowing the judgment of God, but they act like they don't know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. They are spiritually and morally callous. And then fourthly, look at verse 19 now in Ephesians 4, they are depraved in their mind. 
who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Lasciviousness is the practice of every kind of impurity, the absence of all moral restraint, especially in the areas of sexual sins, unbridled self-indulgence. Peter describes them in 2 Peter 2. You can look that up later. When you get to this level, uh, it's just bad. I mean, it's really, really, really bad. And the world is, is full of this nonsense. It just, it's terrible. Rejection of God, a rejection of God's truth and righteousness finally results in what Paul referred to in Romans uh, chapter 1 and verse 28 as a depraved mind. They are depraved in their mind. They can't, they can't reason. They can't think straight. They don't understand truth. And when indecency becomes a way of life, and it has for untold numbers of people become a way of life, every aspect of their life is corrupted, it is distorted, and it is destroyed. I knew a man once, I'm sorry, I knew a woman once, and her son turned 16 years old on his 16th birthday. And you know what she did for him on her own son's 16th birthday? They went into their house and got high on pot that she had purchased. So when her son turned 16, he could get high. Now what kind of a stupid mother does stuff like that? Well, she did. So sometimes it's like, you know, you say, I, no, I, and there's nothing somebody can tell me that would blow me away. Well, that would blow me away. It's just unbelievable. Then I want you to notice the contrast. That was enough of the bad stuff. Uh, verses 20 through 24 give us the contrast, and I'm going to try to hurry through this, with the walk of the new man. The new walk in Christ is the direct opposite of the old man. I would have to say this, if anybody, I would say to 21, so whatever you picture is a lost 21-year-old person living life, that's exactly how I lived my life, okay? So when you are saved out of that kind of a lifestyle, the change is radical. Yes, and I would have to say that anybody who is saved later in life, if they're a genuine believer and they are serious about the things of God, they are radically different than what they were. And I mean radically different. They don't talk like, they don't dress the same, they don't do anything the same. They just, they're transformed. The new walk of Christ is the direct opposite of the old man. Where the old man was self-centered, the new man is Christ-centered. The new man has purpose in his life. Jesus gives purpose to life. The old is ignorant of God's truth. The, other, the, the new man understands it, and he knows it. And aren't you glad that when you pick up your King James Bible, you can read it and understand it and know what God's telling you? But you know what? Before you're saved, you can't do that. But now you can Praise the Lord. The old is morally and spiritually callous, shameless. The new is sensitive to sin of every sort. The old is depraved in its thinking. And as it said in Romans chapter 12, the new, the new man is renewed in his mind. Now, let me mention a few things about the new man. First of all, his mind is Christ-centered. Look at verse 20. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. Paul is declaring to believers who had fallen back into such wickedness. He says, look it, you guys didn't learn that by coming to Christ. That's not the way of Christ. That's not the way of the Christian life. You can't live any way you want to live after you receive Jesus as your Savior. And there is some of this ungodliness even accepted in some mainline denomination churches today. Verse 20 is actually a direct reference to salvation. To learn Christ is to be saved. Jesus gave a sweet invitation to salvation when he said in Matthew, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So learn Christ. This learning is the moment of salvation. Remember what James said? He said, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is the is that enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. There are people that are enemies of God. They probably wouldn't admit that, but they are. The person who makes a profession of faith in Jesus 
but makes no effort to break with his worldly sinful habits, listen, has no reason to think that his salvation was real. Look, if you would, please, at 1 John chapter 2. And there's only two verses there I want you to look at, but verse 4 and verse 15. First John 2, 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. You don't know God. And it says that the truth is not in him. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. They don't know God, they don't love God. Let me read a couple other verses there. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, there are people out there that have made a false profession of faith in Jesus. When we say false, we mean fake. They said they've accepted Christ as Savior, but in reality they have not. We don't know who they all are. I think we surmise who some are. But when the so there's wheat and tares. Are we supposed to be the one that separates them? No. The angels will do that at the end. But they are there. The ways of God and the ways of the world are not compatible. I mentioned already there is a different worldview, there is a different philosophy, but there is also a different lifestyle. And to think that a person can be a Christian. And never give up anything is just bizarre. It's just bizarre. To tell people that you can get saved just as you are and you can stay just as you are is so far removed from scriptural truth it's not funny. God changes, you've heard me say this many times, God changes our want to. We don't want to do like that. We don't live like that anymore. And uh, not only that, we lay down our will to his will. We lay down our freedoms at the cross. We lay down everything there, our will to his will. The idea promoted by many under the pretense of elevating God's grace, I suppose, and protecting the gospel from works will do nothing but send a lot of people down the path that leads to destruction, Jesus called it in Matthew chapter 7. From a human side, salvation begins with repentance. It's a change of mind, action regarding sin and self and God. John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, the apostle Paul, all the way to the very end of the book of Acts, preached repentance. In fact, later in Acts, Paul said, repent towards God and what? Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, salvation saves us from sin. So to preach, come as you are and stay as you are, is not found in the Bible. Pray a prayer, live and do whatever you want to do and say, and God's all good with that. Is God really good with that? No, no. I call that easy believism. It's a false gospel. And here's their argument. They say to repent is human works. And they say you need to stop, the people teach you need to stop sinning before you can be saved. Quite honestly, I've never heard anybody teach that. Nor have I ever read a gospel tract that teaches that, nor have I ever read a book. And I read a lot of books. I've never read that anywhere, heard that anywhere. I had a conversation with a guy out of our church recently, uh, and he says, I have. I said, well, maybe one once in a while somewhere, but I said, I've been in ministry a lot longer than you have, and I've never come across it. Listen, God expects something out of us, church. Now, to preach. Come as you are and stay just as you are. No. 
We know, listen, we know salvation is not reformation. We know that. We know salvation is not keeping the Ten Commandments. We understand that. We also understand that no Christian is totally free from the presence of sin in their life. We get that. But in Christ, he is willingly free from his desire to sin. So when I say God changes our want to, I really mean God changes our want to. So I mentioned I was saved at 21. I don't live anything like that. It's not even remotely close. Well, that's not totally true. I still hunt and fish and fish, right? My son will like I did back then, too. But anyway. But then you know what I mean. Morally, I'm like yours from where I was. Believers slip away. We know that. Believers fall many times. We know that. But the determined direction of their life is to stay away from sin. That's what they long for. When you sin, you say, well, I just don't sin. Okay, nobody believes you. Okay, when you, when you sin, what does it do in here? How do you feel? It shouldn't bother me at all. There's something wrong with it. There's just something wrong with it. The believer has the mind of Christ. The Bible says, and that he died for all, and that he, we, we they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. At salvation, we lay down our will. And because we have accepted the mind of Christ, Paul says this in Philippians, just a couple of pages from where you are, turn to chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, verse 8. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That ought to be our desire. Now listen. Here's your target. Some of you guys are going to start hunting pretty quick and you're going to get your guns out and you're going to go out target practice to make sure you can hit it. It's something. All right? The target of the Christian life is to think like Christ. It is to act like Christ. It is to love like Christ. As much as possible, it is to be like Christ. Amen. That's your target. It's like if you were in a dark, I just did that. If you throw darts, you try to get the little red dot in the middle. I don't know that I ever have, but that's my target. I try once in a while. The Christ-centered life is the most purposeful and meaningful life conceivable. And listen, it's, it's God's plan for us. The new self has a, self, has a Christ-centered mind. Secondly, verse 21 back in Ephesians 4, if so be that you have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, we know God's truth. What a blessing to know God's truth. Here is a major difference in the philosophies of the world. We have a final authority. They don't. They have a religion called humanism. It's, written, it's mentioned in the end of the book of Judges where it says every man does that which is right in his own eyes. But that's a bad postscript at the end of that book, I can promise you. We have a final authority. We have the word of God. We have truth about God. We know truth about God. We know truth about man. We know truth about where we came from in creation. We know truth about history, sin, righteousness, grace, faith, salvation, life, death, purpose, meaning, relationships. Heaven, hell, judgment, eternity, on and on. We have God's truth on all of those things. The Bible says in 1 John 5, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding, that we may know Him that is true, and that we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Thank God for the Word. And we get it. Thirdly, we are delivered from the old self. Now let me just hurry up here. But verse 22. That he put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Put that off. Lay it down. And then he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Get into your Bible so you can get your mind renewal. And then you put on the new man. So you put off the old. You put on the new, which is after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put off the old. Put on the new. It's like taking off filthy clothes, taking them off, and putting new clothes on. And you, it, it's all better. 
It's more than sorrow from sin, though. It's a turning from it. And um, you still have your marker in Romans 6. Go back to chapter. Romans 6, uh, chapter. Verse 12. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. I said we're, 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 not, we're not subject to reigning sin. That ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God. Right. Now that's what we're supposed to do. God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye walk, I'm sorry, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? He says, God forbid, no. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, as servants ye are to whom you obey, whether unto sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness, to iniquity, and unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. By the way, let me just sit around verse 21. Some of us have done things we're terribly ashamed of. And nobody will ever know about them. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become the servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end of lasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Christ, our Lord. Then fourthly, we become the new man that God intends us to be, back in Ephesians 4, verses 23 and 24. Now, I would stop there, but I still have several. I wrote a way too long of a sermon. I have several pages I haven't even looked at. Well, I've looked at them, but not in here. But let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. We read the word holiness. That's the sacred observance of all the duties to God. We read the word righteousness, and it relates to our fellow men and reflects the second part of the Ten Commandments, while the first one that relates to God represents the first four commandments. From Romans 6 and 7, we learn that Paul lets us know that being, a new, being made in the image of God does not eliminate sin. It is still present in the flesh, the body, the unredeemed humanness. But God wants us, wants me, he wants me to put off that old man, which the picture that Paul painted of him in the first part of Ephesians 4 that we read today is not pretty. And he wants us to put on the new man. Now, if you're here, and you are struggling with a sin problem, or if you're watching on the broadcast with a sin problem, you need to confess it, and you need to also repent of it. And in Proverbs 28, 13, I mean, you are eternal from it. Give it to the Lord. Lay it down. And do a 180, as the kids say, and walk away from it. Not to go back in. That's what God would have you do. And we read a couple of lists of sins that are possible in the believer's life. But that's not how God wants us to live. So we have to be different in the world if we're going to reach souls for Jesus. We have to be different in the world if we're going to live pleasing to our Father. We just have to. God compels us to do so. So if you don't feel that compelling, and you say, my want to has never changed one bit, Pastor, you have every reason to doubt that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ.
I pray that you would come to know him as your Savior. I mentioned earlier what the gospel is. If you're viewing our broadcast and you want more information, contact us, please. But I want to pray that God has spoken to you. Now it's your turn to speak to him. Father, I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, if they've not put off the old man, put on the new man, and sin has no negative effect on them whatsoever, that the Spirit of God would work in their heart and work in their life. And if they need to be saved, and I, I, I can't always tell the weak from the terror, if they need to be saved, we would pray that your Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, work in their heart until they come to Christ. But for Christians here, especially because the book is written to a church, if there is no sin in their life, and it's a known habitual sin, I pray that they would all get rid of them today and cleanse them things, whatever it is. And the Spirit of God, you can, you, He can tell the children to what their sin problem is. We pray that He will. In Jesus' name. Amen.